So welcome back, everyone, and welcome to session two, which is Vegetations and Masses, uh, being presented here from TGH and moderated by myself, as or curated by myself, as well as Dr. Vansovic. I'm very happy to introduce our moderator for this session, which is Dr. Lauren Sharifi, who is our newest addition here at Toronto General Hospital. We're really happy to have him. Looking forward to the great things that he'll do in the next couple of years. He was a fellow here at Toronto General Hospital, having previously completed his training in anesthesia and critical care in London, United Kingdom. His areas of interest include cardiovascular critical care and medical education, and the care, uh, sorry, and he has recently published a review on the clinical applications of perioperative 3D TEE. Lawrence? Right, thank you. Um, so our uh, first session in this um, part two is um, veg uh, on vegetation and mashes is a combined talk uh, by two of our um, staff here at Toronto General, um, RJ Kusumano and Dr. Annette Vegas. Um, this is a surgeon and anesthesiologist. Um, they're covering cardiac masses from the surgeon's perspective and um, T evaluation of uh, cardiac tumors. Uh, Dr. RJ Kusumano is a cardiac surgeon at the Peter Monk Cardiac Center here at Toronto General. Uh, he's a professor of surgery at the University of Toronto. He's the inaugural holder of the Sam, uh, Cinnamon um, Professorship in Cardiovascular Innovation and Education at the Peter Monk Cardiac Centre. In addition to his clinical duties, he has been deeply interested in education. He was the Programme Director of Cardiac Surgery at the University of Toronto and at uh, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. He helped in the development and implementation of the competency-based curriculum that is now existence across Canada. He's taught both within the University, Canada, internationally as well, having either taught or helped in program development in China, Ethiopia, Sri Lanka, Brazil, Europe, and the US. In 2016, he conceived and held the first Toronto Cardiac Tumor Conference, which brings the world's experts in the field of cardiac tumors on a yearly basis together. Recently, he conceived and has been working on the Interact project, which is the international registry to assess cardiac tumors. This is a global initiative to capture all cardiac tumors across the world. It's a multinational, multidisciplinary endeavor, which will bring these centers around the world together to try and improve care and um, outcome in these very rare tumors. Recently, he was in Africa to help develop a plan to harmonize interaction on the continent. And eventually, he would like to develop a subspecialty of cardiac surgery in the area of cardiac tumors. And Dr. Annette Vegas, um, our co-speaker graduated um, from medical school at McGill University here in Montreal, Canada. She completed an anesthesia residency at the University of Toronto. She conducted a cardiac anesthesia fellowship at Toronto General Hospital, where she's practiced since 1994. She has an interest in echocardiography and has developed web-based educational materials, um, most notably the um, TE simulator, which is used by many of us for teaching and both uh, transesophageal and transthoracic echocardiography. Annette has published um, extensively um, across journal articles and book chapters, authored textbooks and co-edited textbooks related to echocardiography. She's a professor of anesthesiology and an elected fellow of the American Society of Echocardiography. In 2020, um, she resumed the role of director of perioperative TEE here at Toronto General Hospital. I will uh, pass over to them um, to start their presentation. Thanks very much, Lawrence, for the kind in, uh, introduction and the invitation to speak today. Uh, RJ and I thought we would just tag team it today. So we're in this conference room at Toronto General Anesthesia Department, and we've combined our talks. So we hope to entertain you over the next 55 minutes uh, with exclusively talking about cardiac tumors. Um, So, RJ, I don't know if you remember, but in a galaxy far, far, far away in 20, in 2006, we actually gave this talk uh, in uh, the Renaissance Hotel in downtown Toronto. My, we've come a long way. Uh, and the talk was entitled uh, Intracardiac Masses. And you may remember some of your friends came along to some of the anesthesia department and, and the surgeons as well. Uh, we've gone to, to virtual now, so hopefully um, more people will enjoy uh, the information we have today. 
My only disclosure is that I run this um, yearly conference, the Toronto Cardiac Tumor Conference. It's free, it's online. And I would suggest anybody wants to know anything about a particular tumor to go search it out there because we bring the world's experts for this and there are all past presentations there on there. It's lectures by those people. And in terms of my conflict of interest, I only have two disclosures. One, I do receive book royalties from Springer International and uh, a speaker honorarium for Abbott. So. So when I see a cardiac tumor, we're going to talk about the different approaches to the cardiac tumor. And that we'll talk about the echo approach and I'll talk about the surgical approach. When I see a tumor, I say, what the heck is it? And it can it be treated. And is echo important in this particular case uh, that we see? And from my perspective, the answers to those questions are yes. Uh, what is it? It's an echogenic mass. Can it be treated? Maybe. And is echo important? Yes, it's essential. And uh, for those of you who work here, you know, we've, we've just rebranded ourselves. So we're going to treat you to never being done is what we do here. And that's really what this talk is going to be a little bit about. So the objectives are really going to be to demonstrate common and uncommon tumors that we see here. We see very, very uncommon tumors here at Toronto General Hospital just because um, we've done a fair number of them. We're going to describe the workup and the principles in treating cardiac tumors and why we can resect such gigantic tumors and have the patient survive and describe how echo is really important, I think it is, in assessing the cardiac tumor. We're going to talk about other modalities, but we'll talk specifically about how echo is important. So the principles really are uh, the infiltrative lesions of the heart, infiltrative lesions into the walls can be resected without affecting ventricular volume because the tumor stretches out the myocardium. It's as if the seed gets in there and it grows and it stretches the myocardium out. And also that the tumor that as it grows into the uh, chamber will take up ventricular volume. It's, it displaces blood. So when we remove that tumor, there's going to be enough residual volume left and residual wall left in order for that person to have a functional heart. So we're changing the tumor volume for blood volume. And that's how we can. Those are two very important principles. And uh, not only does it affect ventricular volume, but also it doesn't affect cardiac output. So you have a person who has a huge, car huge tumor filling the heart. When you take it out, the cardiac output does not fall. And the reason is because the volume taken up by the tumor is replaced by blood after the resection. So the stroke volume actually goes up in some instances instead of go down. And the most important thing though, is that the imaging doesn't tell the pathology. The behavior suggests the pathology, but the imaging itself, no matter what type of imaging, how, how advanced it is, does not tell us what the pathology is. So we have to look at the behavior on that particular image to tell us, give us an idea about what it is. So when we talk about primary cardiac neoplasms, we have to recognize that this is, these are rare birds. Um, primary tumors are extremely rare. They're 0.03%. Uh, most of the tumors that we see are metastatic. Of the primary cardiac tumors, 75% are benign and 25% of malignant. So when we think about the benign tumors, we think about uh, things like myxoma, lipoma, fibroblastoma, and you can read the list here. Uh, and they are the majority of the tumors. 25% are malignants, and by the vast majority of these are sarcomas, there are lymphomas, and mesotheliomas. Um, the 2015 WHO uh, classification also included something called an intermediate class, which were tumors that came of different cell origins uh, that were not necessarily uh, falling under malignant or benign. There are many different imaging modalities you can use, obviously. Um, you can use uh, um, echo, either regular echo, that's very, very commonly a person has an echo and discloses a tumor. Um, and you can use the advanced things, 3D echo, transesophageal echo, et cetera. And there, it's very, very important because it assesses the size, obviously morphology, but it also talks about the motion of the tumor with respect to the rest of the heart structures. That's why it really is very, very important, even though it's a first modality, even if it wasn't done as a first modality, it should be done on every single cardiac tumor. Everybody thinks you need an MRI. It, it helps us with respect to the morphology, the internal structures of the heart. CT scan is very common uh, because it's very quick, very quick to get, but it doesn't give us the same kind of internal structure analysis and, and determination as the cardiac MRI. 
And PET scanning is a little bit more common. It helps us to differentiate most of the time, but not all the time, malignant versus, versus benign disease. Uh, no matter what kind of imaging you have, again, it doesn't tell you pathology, but sometimes it doesn't tell you the whole truth. Here's a patient who had a sarcoma, and we had gotten every imaging described in that. And I went in there and found all of this sort of surface um, malignant spread to the uh, pericardium. And even when we went back and looked after I opened the chest to the TEE, even the big one you see at the bottom, you want to point that one out? Even the big one there, the great big one right there, that was not seen by TE echo. So no matter what it is, you always need a biopsy, and then you need to go into the heart, and sometimes you'll find a surprise. So from an echocardiographic point of view, what do we specifically look at and identify with, with each a cardiac tumor. Ideally, we'd like to look at something simple like location. Is there more than one? So multiplicity. We'd like to, to measure the size, look at if uh, there's any attachment and to what it is attached, how mobile this structure is, any effect it might have, such as obstruction of valves, um, if there's any vascularity involved, and this may be through uh, lowering our Doppler uh, Nyquist, or this may be uh, sometimes transthoracically using contrast. Uh, we'd like to describe it, whether the tumor is echogenic or non-echogenic, whether it's got calcium in, in it, and finally, whether there's any pericardial effusion or not. From a surgical point of view, what I want to know is, is there invasion? Because remember, it doesn't tell us what it is, but the behavior, if there's invasion of structures, or through walls, that gives us a, a big idea. There has to be a limited involvement to be resectable. And even though the Cine MRI can give you a suggestion of these things, movement and invasion, I think echo is much, much better at doing this and I'll always get an echo. This is um, the, the uh, pathology. This tells us that by far and away, by far and away, myxoma is the most common tumor a primary cardiac tumor that we will see by far and away. The second are papillary fibroelastomas. And you look at the sarcomas in the box at the end, they're very, very uncommon, but they do exist. And the most common malignant tumor is a sarcoma. But by far and away, if you see a mass in the heart, statistically, it's going to be a myxoma. So we're going to take you through a curated session now of, of really benign cardiac tumors. And we've chosen the following eight to look at. Um, and we'll, we'll sort of look at uh, how these patients present, a little bit about what their investigations were before they get to the operating room. It's not a surprise when they get to the operating room that they have a mask, but we'll look at the mask. We'll look at what RJ did to, to fix them and uh, the post-op echoes. So the first uh, pathology we're going to look at are myxomas. And, and as RJ mentioned, these are by far the most common tumor that you're going to find in the heart. Uh, they present mostly in adults in an older age group, 50 to 70, and have a female predominance. Uh, it's important to recognize that not all tumors are symptomatic, but when they are symptomatic, uh, they can present with some sort of inflammatory response, such as fever, malaise, or rash. They can have valvular dysfunction, so they can cause uh, obstruction leading to syncope or death. Uh, some regurgitation, and if you auscultate, they may have a specific S3 sound for tumor falling uh, through the valve. And finally, most devastatingly, sometimes they can present with embolization um, from either the left atrium or the left ventricle to, to, the, uh, to the brain, the coronaries, or some peripheral structure. Uh, rarely do they get right atrial embolization to the lung. Uh, myxomas are uh, usually solitary. They can be if a person has a, a Carney's complex, which is a genetic predisposition, and they can have rarely uh, dumbbell type tumors when they go through the uh, interatrial septum or they grow on the interatrial septum. But they're most most commonly in the left atrium, less commonly in the right atrium, and in, uh, increasingly rare in both ventricles. Usually the ventricular ones are... Um, associated with genetic defects, but we have seen isolated ventricular myxomas as well. There are three different types of myxomas that they discuss. One is a smooth type you see on the left-hand side, and the other one is irregular, and that's the classic myxoma, gelatinous irregular type. And then there's a villus type. It looks like a, looks like a moth that's floating in the breeze. And you can see the distribution. They're all about the same. The large ones tend to be the villous ones, probably because they're elongated. 
but embolic ones are the villous ones. If you have a smooth or even the irregular ones, the embolic presentation is not as often. Um, the myxoma surgical indications are at the time of the diagnosis period. We used to do these as a an emergency operation, and more recently, we haven't done them as often. If it's the villus type, the really ugly looking villus type, we will tend to do it much, much sooner. But if it's the ball type, we tend to take a little bit of time and perhaps get a coronary angiogram and even put it on the next day or the day after, et cetera. It's really to prevent embolic complications. And so that's when we try to determine whether it's urgent versus emergent. Um, you see the percentage of people that die from embolic complications prior to surgery. So this really can cause a problem. And if they're over 40 years old, we try to get coronary angiography before. It depends on what the morphology looks like on echo and the presentation. We obviously want to do a complete resection. We want to remove the tumor, not just scrape it off. Because if you leave tumor cells behind, it's not a surprise when they grow back. Nobody really knows how long they take to grow because when you discover them, they get taken out. Uh, I personally open both the left and the right atrium, so I get a bi-atrial approach to them. And I try to avoid tumor manipulation, especially in those that are not the obvious round, solid type. If they're round, solid type is a different story. Try not to interact with the tumor in terms of breaking it open because it's tumor spillage of cells. We talk about this in malignant disease, but we should think about it for benign disease as well. And uh, the patient may need to have coronary bypass at time. In other words, a patient comes for coronary surgery, do an echo and find a myxoma. We do the myxoma first or the cardiac tumor first to prevent embolization with manipulation of the heart. The good thing about myxomas is they don't affect lifespan. So this is a study out of the Mayo Clinic where they looked at 50-year experience and they found, incidentally, only 194 patients in the 50 years in, in the Mayo Clinic. But they found that the survival after myxoma resection equaled that of general population. They usually don't recur, but sometimes they do, and it could be up to 20 years later. So that's one of the reasons we ex expect the tumor to be removed along with normal myocardium. Around it. And that's why they should have an echo every year. I say for five years, perhaps every second year after that for the next 10 years, just to make sure it doesn't recur. So we're finally getting to some echo images, and these are not subtle tumors. Uh, they can be quite large when they present, and this is a tumor involving uh, the inter atrial septum in the left atrium. You can see that it's quite echogenic and smooth. Uh, it's large, it's solitary, uh, it's polypoid. Um, and you can see here that it's actually prolapsing through the mitral valves, valve and causing some pseudo obstruction there. This is the type of tumor that's the smooth type, and you can see how large it really is. It is very smooth. These do not embolize. These things obstruct. And so that's what they look like at the time. This is, you can see, in this particular case, we went through the right atrium, and you can see me holding up the piece of the myocardium along with the tumor, so we don't leave any tumors behind. And you can see here in the post-op echo that, uh, um, I don't know, RJ, did you reconstruct the intraatrial septum or did you just close it primarily, do you think? Well, I tried to remove the tumor along with the intraatrial septum, so there's always a piece of bovine pericardium there. That's what I use, bovine pericardium. I'm sorry, uh, either a bovine or autologous pericardium. Some people use uh, some people use Dacron. The other thing with these very large tumors is you have to ensure that the person doesn't have an annular dilation, so that should be one of the measurements that you take because these things grow and they may stretch it, and afterwards you may be surprised to find that the person has either mitral or tricuspid regurgitation, so they may need a ring. So you can see there how the coaptation of the mitral leaflets are. So one of the things that we need to know at the beginning is what the annular diameter is. This is not a myxoma, this is a sarcoma. And that's why it looks about the same as a, as a um, um, large tumor, but it's again, the pathology is determined by the pathologist, not by the imaging study. So they may look very, very similar. So this is, uh, it's twin on the right side. This is a right atrial myxoma, and you can see that it's here quite pedunculated, sitting off the intraatrial septum. Again, it's smooth, it's large, it's solitary. Uh, it does have limited mobility. And when you look at it here, it's causing not so much obstruction through the tricuspid valve, though there is a, a certain amount of tricuspid regurgitation. You can see here where the tricuspid annulus was. And you can see how gradually as that thing grew, it would stretch the tricuspid annulus out. 
I must say that you can see the, um, with a big blue arrow there, you can see where I resected the intraatrial septum. And one of the behaviors that tells you it may not be a myxoma is that it's not in the intraatrial septum. That sarcoma we showed in the previous slide was not there. It was uh, in from the free wall, and that told us that there's something funny about this myxoma. So always think about where the tumor is, and you can see how this can be stretched out. You can see in the post-op image there, you may be able to get an impression that I tightened up the tricuspid annulus there. You can imagine that the cuspid annulus is quite large. So this is a, another left atrial myxoma, and we showed this one largely because here uh, the Nyquist limit was reduced, and you can see that there is some vascularity to these tumors. Uh, again, it's of moderate size, it's solitary, uh, it involves the intraatrial septum. It does have more of an irregular shape to it than the previous ones we showed, uh, which uh, RJ is, uh, how important is that? Um, I think it's very important. Uh, fibroelastomas, which we all think are tiny, tiny little tumors, um, either on the myocardium or shown here, it's a rare uh, fibroelastoma there, but uh, they can grow that large. And so it's really important to know what the regularity looks like. These are much, much more dangerous in terms of embolization, much, much more pre-op as well as interoperative. The vascularity is important as well. So these are just some more examples of atrial myxoma. This is that biatrial tumor. Um, this was a patient that presented with syncope and a TIA, and you can see it crossing the interatrial septum. It's a rather large uh, mass that has ragged, uh, uh, sort of a ragged appearance. And the other one is uh, a smaller mass that's that's uh, attached to the right atrium, not the interatrial septum, but it's attached near the IVC. Uh, again, it's solitary, it's uh, polypoid, it's pedunculated, it has this independently mobile uh, motion to it. So RJ, how would you approach these tumors? Because they're quite different. Yeah, so the first thing is in the OR, I would not touch the heart. Uh, and uh, sometimes I'll even snare the SVC and the IVC after we cross clamp in case a piece of it breaks off. I must say that that tumor that you show that in the left on the bi biatrial tumor, that may very well be a malignancy. Malignancies aren't necessarily solid. Uh, that may be a fibroelastoma because they can grow that large. But the most important is don't touch the heart. Know where it comes from and then enter the right atrium. I always enter the right atrium. And then based on what the echo and the other imaging shows, I'll cut away opposite direction of where it is. So if it's coming from the right superior pulmonary vein side, I'll cut towards the tricuspid valve side. And again, once we finish that case, once we open up the left side, um, I will always look everywhere inside the left atrium, the pulmonary veins, the left atrial appendage, and even in the ventricle when something is this mobile to make sure we get it all out. And does it affect your cannulation at all? Would you just to righty show cannulation here, or? Um, it depends how close it is to the IVC. I have cannulated the femoral vessels. It's really important that you um, are very careful when you go and bypass, because I've had these things embolize into the, usually the IVC cannula, even though it's pointing towards the IVC. Um, so you have to go and bypass very slowly and then snare the KV very quickly um, before you go on full bypass, because they can go and get sucked into the um, cannulas and obstructive cannulas as well. That's happened to us for each one of those. All right. So we're going to talk about uh, papillary fibroelastomas, which which are the which are another common um, primary tumor. They're the commonest valve tumor, uh, most often associated with the aortic valve, although they can affect all the other valves as shown here. Uh, they affect both genders and mostly adults. And again, they're they're known for their embol risk of embolization because they have a frond-like appearance. Uh, independent predictors are tumor mobility. They can cause stroke on the left side of the heart. So stroke and TIAs, syncope, sudden death with myocardial infarction. There's one paper that you should know. It's actually an echo paper out of the Mayo Clinic. And what they did is they found 511 patients over 15 years on their echoes. And they looked at all these fibroelastomas and they report, it's a very nice paper to look at. They report um, size, risk of embolization, et cetera. You can see the right-sided tumors are larger than the left-sided tumors in general, as we'd expect. But what they found is the five-year neurologic event rate was equal with warfarin, aspirin, or nothing. 
So people will often uh, will often anticoagulate patients who have a fibroblastoma, but there's no evidence in the literature that this makes any difference at all. You should also know that for uh, she showed us that the myxomas and fibroblastoma do occur in children as well. So when you're looking at uh, sort of this uh, malignancy, um, the fibroblastoma usually occurs, as we mentioned, on the aortic valve. Now remember that lambdal's excrescences also occur on the aortic valve. You can have vegetations, you can uh, unusually have thrombus, but you do follow this. And this was, a, I think, a patient that had a couple of echoes and uh, they saw this mass growing on the aortic valve. So they referred them on to RJ. Um, but you can see that it's kind of, this is a transthoracic image. It's echogenic, it's irregular. They're small, they're multiple. Um, when you look at it in transesophageal, they look very similar to the transthoracic. Uh, Sometimes you can get a little bit more detail looking at it transesophageal. And here you can see it with 3D, and you can see there are multiple uh, lesions here. Now, whether these are all fibroblastomas uh, or whether there's uh, some just some simple Lambel's excrescences, I don't think you can, you can uh, differentiate the two. Uh, RJ, is it common to have multiple lesions like this, or do you think just, just one lesion here? Uh, I think there's multiple lesions. It's really surprising if you put your loops on and you look at these, sometimes you'll see what looks like grass on the leaflets. Uh, they're not smooth leaflets. I don't know what it is about these fibroblastomas, but they can occur in multiple spots. And when you review them, I don't normally put my loops on for an aortic valve problem, but you'll see sometimes grass growing. Having said that, the treatment for this is not necessarily a valve replacement unless you can't really get it off everything. This is one where we do sort of scrape off and and try to preserve the valve. If it's an older individual, you may want to change it, that's fine. But in general, some of these things happen in very young individuals and try to preserve the valve. But you'll see more often than not other areas that uh, may not be as large, but are present. And this is a bit more of a classical fibroblastoma here. You can see it's described as having this pom-pom shape. Um, it's on the, the downstream side, so it's uh, echogenic, it's smooth, it's small, it's solitary. Um, you can see if you look at it in short axis, it thinks, you think it might be prolapsing through the aortic valve, but when long axis, it's clearly not. And in 3D, you can see that it's really attached to that lower right coronary cusp there. This particular individual is having some ventricular tachycardia actually during pregnancy. And so we waited till the pregnancy was finished. And you can see what the thing looks like in, in life that was along the right coronary cusp. And that's what it looks like, a gelatinous structure. Until you put it into water, you can't really tell the difference between that and a and a um, myxoma, one of the more complex types of myxoma. So it really comes down to pathology. I thought I removed a papillary fibroblastoma in some individuals, and when the pathology comes back, it's a myxoma. That one there is a fibroblastoma as well. It's a much larger one that was on the intraatrial septum. So you can't tell the difference between that and a myxoma, but that happened to be a pathology of fibroblastoma. So they can grow quite large. All right, so the next lesion we're gonna talk about is a fibroma, and RJ, this wasn't your case, but this is a patient who presented to another surgeon at this hospital. Uh, it's uh, you know a fairly large mass involving the, the left ventricle. It's echogenic, it's smooth, it's large, it's solitary. It doesn't really have a lot of motion to it. And the question was whether it was attached to the free wall or the intraventricular septum. And um, as the echocardiographer, I was asked the following question. Based on these 2D images, the best surgical approach in this patient is, is it through the left atrium, left ventricle, aortic valve, or the right ventricle? Um, and you might sort of think about this a little bit. Um, this was about 2008. And I have to say, this was when we first started using 3D echo. And this was one of the first cases where I thought 3D actually made a huge difference here. And you can see that in the four chamber view, uh, you can see it kind of dangling in the left ventricle there. And if you look in the long axis view, you can see actually that it's, it may be actually attached to the intraventricular septum. We actually were able to crop down and show that it actually was quite pedunculated and attached just to the intraventricular septum, uh, intraventricular septum close to the aortic valve. And if you look at it through the left ventricular outflow tract, this is what you see. Um, so in this particular instance, um, the surgeon actually elected to resect this tumor. 
uh, through the aortic valve. Yeah, it's a great example of how 3D imaging can help you uh, uh, over 2D imaging. Now, I must say, as a surgeon, you guys are way better than us at imagining where things are, you guys and the radiologists. As a surgeon, we need something sometimes like a 3D echo to help us to understand where it's coming from. So this is an example of hemangioma. These are benign vascular tumors. They can involve any cardiac chamber, um, and there can be um, multiple lesions. Uh, this was one that was described as being echolucent, smooth, uh, large, and solitary. Um, and in fact, uh, I don't know, RJ, this I don't think was your patient either. I was there. You were there. Okay. Um, you were there. This is the same patient. This tells us with a CT scan, there's something fishy going on because you see some internal structures, and that structure happened to be the LAD. And so we went to the OR to see what this was because in those days we didn't do percutaneous biopsies. There's only one way to biopsy it, is to biopsy it and locally. We saw that that's what the tumor looked like. It was resectable if we needed to do transplantation, but that's what that hemangioma looked like coming from uh, through the LED. You can see in the red, the red uh, thing on the left side, the LED was coursing through it. So it's an unresectable tumor, benign. We found that out after we biopsied it and resectable in terms of a heart transplant. This patient's, I've been following this patient for about 15 years now without any change in its size. So benign tumors are quite silent and they won't grow. So this, this is another example of a hemangioma here. You can see it on CT scan. This was more of an endo uh, cavitary lesion here, which is, it frequently is described as being. It often involves uh, the ventricles here. This one involved the right ventricle. And you can see there how the, the tumor was quite large. Maybe you can go back a little bit. You can see how quite large and you think, how could you ever get that ventricle? How could you ever resect that? It's taking up most of the ventricular volume. When you get there, you realize what I was saying, how the seed gets into the muscle and it spreads apart. And you can see there's something spreading that myocardium apart. So when we finally resected it, in the blue area, you see the actual amount of myocardium that was lost. So that's the principle that I was talking about. A tumor can be resected from the myocardium without affecting the number of myocardial cells damaged because it spreads the myocardium apart. And the interventricular volume is now replaced by blood that was normally myocardial. So this patient did absolutely fine. So uh, you can also have other tumors, and this is a, an SVC hamartoma. So a hamartoma is an abnormal growth of embryonic cells. And RJ, I think you can show in the circles, right, that these are all the various views of this uh, various lesion. Various CT scan and MRI. You can see internally the MRI at the bottom. You can see the internal structure a little bit better than CT scan. So on echo, you can see here, this is a tumor right next to the SVC, well, in uh, long axis and in short axis. Uh, it has a very smooth shape. It doesn't really seem to want to embolize anywhere, which is good for the patient. The, um, the echo helped us in this particular case because we didn't know if it was involving the aorta. We didn't know this was a hematoma. Well, we knew is there was an SVC tumor in that area that was abutting, possibly invading the aorta. In this particular case, the echo told us that it wasn't. So that's what it looks like. The hamartoma is a very simple resection to uh, replace the SVC. And to spare the, uh, this the, is a reconstruction here, is yeah, it, RJ? Yeah. Okay, all right. And you see how on echo, the this, this sort of prevents us from imaging, particularly while there's lots of artifact uh, post-reconstruction here. This is a very common tumor called lipomus hypertrophy of the intraatrial septum. It's found, incidentally, on CT scans of people. They're completely benign. They're, even though it looks very sinister, like it looks like it's really spreading all over the place, and it looks like it's going to block the SVC, they have absolutely no symptoms of SVC syndrome or anything like that. And that's what it looks like at my echo. And this is a really kind of a large uh, lipomus hypertrophy. And, and in this case, the imager is actually rotating the probe around. You can see this is kind of what it would look like normally. Uh, but as you rotate the probe around, you can see that it's, it can actually fill up this entire right atrium here. Um, would you do anything about this, RJ? Would you operate on this patient? or? Now what you have to do is differentiate it from a low-grade sarcoma. But if it's in the classic spot, and the person's willing and is completely asymptomatic. Usually malignancies tell themselves if they're benign, they're usually silent. The patient has a choice of either having a repeat echo in three months or a CT scan in three months or have a percutaneous biopsy of that. But in general, we wouldn't do anything about it. This is a patient who had a, a large part. You can see on an x-ray, he had some chest pain. 
And when we got an MRI, we found that there was a fatty tumor. We did do a needle biopsy to, to ensure that this was not uh, malignant because it's a very, very unusual position. The echo showed us that there was movement between the myocardium and the heart. You can see in the bottom left-hand corner, there is movement. The thing slides, you can see it shows part right over there. Right up there, you can see there's the thing sliding. It was attached to the heart, but that gave me great um, confidence that I could go in and resect the tumor. Yeah, you can see that it's quite a large tumor here. And it was, you know, you don't really see that sliding in the metasophageal views. But when you go down to the transgastric views and, and you see both in this biplane view here, uh, this is what RJ is looking for. He's looking to see whether there's a plane that he can use and, and resect this tumor. So again, something that was uh, important to identify in this patient. Yeah, the MRI did not tell us that there was movement or sliding of that thing, but the echo shows exactly where it was attached. And if you show the next picture, that's what the clinical image showed. And the blue picture will show us where it was actually attached. And the echo was very, very precise in telling us where that was. This was a, as you call it, lipoma was actually yeah. Pathologically, a liposarcoma. Uh, it was a liposarcoma. Now, this is a paraganglioma. This is a very rare tumor, more rare than uh, sarcomas. But when they show up on the CT scan, it looks like a lymph node and an angiogram. It's a very, very impressive angiogram. And these two things together will tell us that this patient has a paraganglioma, which would be a pheochromocytoma in a non adrenal position. So, because it's a pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma, a neuroendocrine tumor, you have to ensure that this is not metabolically active before you operate. A PET scan is very hot, but you don't need a PET scan for this particular tumor. It's one of the instances where a, where a positive PET scan is, is lying in terms of the malignant. And it, it has quite an unusual um, location, I guess, uh, in on echo. You can see it here, it's, uh, what would be almost outside the heart, um, uh, near the right atrium uh, and the tricuspid valve here. Uh, when you look at it, it, it does seem to infiltrate a bit into the heart as well. Um, it's uh, sessile. It doesn't look like it wants to, to go anywhere, but it does have some color flow in it. These are highly vascular tumors, and they uh, actually grow on the surface of the heart. That's what it looks like. They actually do grow on the surface of the heart, and they are resectable, but you have to have experience in doing this sort. So I was surprised, RJ, that in your resection here, that you didn't really have to do anything to the tricuspid valve. It's just growing outside. It compressed the tricuspid valve, but it's an external compression. They always grow along the base of the heart in the in the paraganglia in the uh, parasympathetic nerves of the heart. So in the AV groove, um, in, in the uh, interatrial septal groove. So this is uh, another patient who came to the OR. RJ, can you describe this on the CT here? The patient in the middle picture, you can see down in the pelvis, or the both pictures you see in the pelvis, the patient has an abnormal uterus. The uterus is very abnormal and is going through the IVC and into the heart. So this usually goes through the um, ovarian vein, which is equivalent to the um, spermatic vein. It goes into the heart, and that's what it looks like. And you can see on echo, it's coming up the, SC, uh, the IVC going into the right atrium. Um, it, it's... Uh, it's not totally obstructing the um, IBC, but it is definitely filling the IBC. Well, that's what it looks like. We've taken a new approach here at Toronto General by instead of doing one whole operation from stem to stern, we chop out the uh, ventricular part and then let the uh, 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 gynecologist chop out the rest of it later on. So this is what it would look like when it was all chopped out in, in different sections. So we're gonna to go to primary malignant cardioneoplasms. And remember, these are the fewer and fewer compared to the benign ones. The malignant ones um, are usually the sarcomas and uh, it gets confusing because sarcomas uh, can arise from any form of the connective tissue, bone, cartilage, muscle, fat, and vascular. So there's different ones. Um, they're very uncommon, okay? Um, they can be mistaken for myxomas. They can invade various structures. Uh, positive margins are common and the best, chance for resection is the first chance. So go ahead. So here you can see that um, the most common locations are the pericardium, myocardium, or endocardium. Uh, they can show with uh, pericardial effusions, tamponade, failure, or arrhythmias. They can form from being contiguous with the heart, uh, migrate up the SVC or the IVC, or be bloodborne. This is just to show that over a 40-year 
experience in large paper, the sarcomas are the most common, followed by lymphomas and mesotheliomas, same as the first paper I showed you. The most important thing about uh, primary sarcoma of the heart is that they're very, very dangerous. This uh, one on the left-hand side shows the comparison of non-cardiac sarcoma lifespan to cardiac sarcoma on the left side. It's um, uh, six months survival for cardiac sarcoma versus 93 months for non-cardiac sarcoma. And then on the other side, if you operate on these people, you give them a survival advantage, but still very poor. Without an operation, a median survival is one month. This patient has um, a metastatic liposarcoma of the thigh, but this went into the right heart. I'm going to cause obstruction and death. This patient had multiple metastases, but this is one of the rare, very, very rare instances where we will do a primary resection of the heart if there's a reasonable outcome for the person otherwise. And I'll introduce you to a new word. It's called ginormous, uh, gigantic and enormous uh, together. So it's a very, very large tumor. Uh, you can see here that it's, uh, it almost looks like a myxoma in some respects because it's sort of attached here to what looks like the intraatrial septum. It seems to be obstructing uh, the tricuspid valve. And uh, most importantly, it seems to fill up the RBOT here. So you can just imagine what a nightmare and an anesthetic this would be and how symptomatic the patient might have been. Uh, and you can see here, uh, there's very little flow through the heart. Um, well, this was a Saturday morning special, if I remember, uh, at, the, at the general. Uh, you know, well, we're just gonna do a little tumor resection on a Saturday morning. So RJ, what did you do? That was a yeah. That was a patient who had a very obstructive sarcoma, and what we did was fill up the patient, put the patient in Trendelenburg to try to get it to not block the um, right atrium, and then go and bypass through the groin. Right. So this was femoral cannulation yeah. to to go on partial bypass, and then put the patient off to sleep, and then uh, basically uh, go on uh, and do the rest of the operation uh, after resection here. Uh, the first echo showed a little bit of tricuspid regurgitation. Um, what do you think, RJ? You went ahead and did a tricuspid valve replacement. Uh, yeah, because there's a there's a difference between benign disease where you put a ring and malignant disease. Malignant disease, that will recur within the time the patient heals. That will be back to the same size again. So we want to get a wider tumor resection for malignant disease compared to benign disease. And that's why we replaced the, the valve. I'm not going to leave that because the patient may need further chemotherapy as much as patient had. This is another primary sarcoma. Sometimes, again, you can't really wait. This is a patient who had a sarcoma. They knew I was interested in sarcoma, so they wanted to get some of these preliminary tests for these patients instead of calling me up right away. And you can see in 25 days from the left-hand side to the right-hand side how much it had grown. This is a sarcoma that's going to use one of the other principles about tumor replacing the ventricular volume of blood. And you can see how that thing, by the time we got to the OR three weeks later, it had completely filled up their left ventricle. So this patient was another sick patient. And the echo you can see on the right-hand side, beautiful picture how there is movement. It isn't invading the whole myocardium. It was invading the, the distal septum. And that gave me a confirmation that I could go in and resect this thing. And based on the principles I told you, I was not worried about the patient surviving in terms of myocardium lost or cardiac output diminished. And there you see me taking out essentially the uh, apex of the heart with the tumor, which is about the same size as the heart. You compare the tumor size to the heart size. There was some mitral regurgitation. Yeah. So afterwards, you know, the tumor's gone, but there's some mitral regurgitation here. Um, you know, you said the 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 um, uh, outcomes were, were not great anyways, that they had maybe a one to three month survival. Um, you did a mitral valve replacement here. Yeah, mitral valve replacement. I didn't want her to um, have, a, have a problem with ongoing mitral regurgitation because this patient had a history of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy as well. This patient's alive two years later. This is an angiosarcoma. And what we do when we seize one of these patients, get a biopsy. Um, treat with uh, chemotherapy, and you can see how it's shrunk down tremendously compared to where it was. In. And does it involve the right coronary there, or? Well, it involves the AV groove, the AV junction, so the right coronary is going to go. So this is going to be, even though it looks much smaller, it's a gigantic resection. Again, it's a specialized area of medicine. This is what a sarcoma looks like. It can be 
uh, looks just like a myxoma or a fibroblastoma, except it's in an abnormal location. So a myxoma in an abnormal location may not be a myxoma. After chemotherapy, it changes. And this is what it looks like at the time of the heart. Um, the uh, picture there shows the right atrium. The head is uh, over to the left-hand side. You see the right atrium and the right ventricle. The tumor was um, the tumor was affecting uh, both both chambers. So it was a large resection. Mm. Sorry, we seem up. to have, or maybe our time is up. Is right. Uh, let me anyway, just see. There's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that you can see there, but you can see how important it is for. Echo. Echo is extremely important in any case that you're going to consider resecting or bringing to the OR. You can't do it without an echo, no matter how complicated everything else is. All right. Let me just see if I can recover this. Uh, are we still on, Lawrence? I think we are. Yeah, I think you have uh, a few more minutes, and then we can go to your question. Okay. Um, so you can see the resection. That, that, that resection required a complete resection of the superior and inferior vena cava, right atrium, tricuspid valve, and coronary artery. So they're very, very large resections. Yeah. And you can see here that there, there was a lot of, um, there's a lot of artifacts. This, this whole stuff was reconstructed with pericardium, right, uh, RJ? Yes, yes. So you can see you don't really see the right atrium very well anymore. The, the right ventricle is kind of limping along, but these are not small operations uh, to do for sure. Not small operations. This is a pulmonary artery sarcoma. It's a pulmonary embolus. They thought this patient had a pulmonary embolus, treated for a number of months, decided it was maybe not. And this is when we're, we're PET scan is useful. And again, you can see that it fills up the whole uh, right uh, PA here, uh, going as far as as one can possibly visualize. And you don't see a lot of flow in this in this right PA at all. This is what the pulmonary artery sarcomas look like. They have to have a resection of the pulmonary artery and the uh, structures that it invades. And you reconstructed this, like it's just yeah, yeah, with yeah. With the bovine graft okay. with, a, with a sac with a dacron. Okay, with the Dacron graft. Okay. This is what a lymphoma looks like. By CT scan, you can see it looks very ugly. And you can see how important echo is here. You can see it crosses the interatrial septum and it's multi uh, multipli uh, sorry, multiplicity in terms of its sites. So you can see here it's it's also attached to the right atrium. Um, so RJ, you, you sort of see this type of patient. Are you going to operate on this patient or? Our primary goal is always to get a, a biopsy first. We would try to do this as a biopsy with a, a transvenous biopsy. This, we would look for a, something somewhere else, especially in a scaling node, which is large and lit up by PET scan. So we biopsied the scaling node, did a transcutaneous biopsy by the heart failure folks to get a biopsy. Both of them were negative. We've got a transcutaneous biopsy, which showed that it was a primary lymphoma. So we try not to operate on these people because they as this person was treated by chemotherapy with CHOP, um, but also because it's so extensive and essentially inoperable because of its widespread. Okay, we're going to come to the end soon here, but, um, you know, we saw the lyomyosarcomas. sarcomas. These are renal cell tumors. Um, this is, again, edging up the um, IVC from the kidney. This is an 80-year-old female who presented with palpitations. And you can see here, um, the patient was taken to the OR, I think as a combined effort, because it was probably at a time when, when these were done uh, as combined efforts. Um, and uh, the patient also had, I think, some coronary disease and, of course, RJ's favorite uh, problem of PFO. Uh, so, so this kind of obliged the patient to have a major cardiac procedure as well as resection of the tumor. But uh, RJ, um, do you do these with uh, just pulling back on that tumor, or do you have to do them as a, an open procedure? Yeah, sometimes it depends on how stuck it is. It, one of the principles I didn't tell is that as a tumor gets into a chamber, it will grow to fill the chamber. So we always look at these. I'm always available, and the folks will open up the belly and pull the liver down, and if it comes back out of the right atrium, even if there's a PFO, pull them out of the right atrium, and if they can get them out of the right atrium, then I don't get it. Otherwise, yes, I do go in there, and then it's a dual approach. I push while they pull, and then clear up the wall to, of any recurrent disease, uh, of any uh, residual disease. Yeah, 
and sort of this, I guess, is what uh, it looks like. Yeah. Looks like. And yeah. You can see the kidney there in the bottom going towards the IVC grows, and as it got into the right atrium, it expanded to fill the space. So there's the IVC showing it as a line inferior to that. You want to show this one here? There it is, and it grows and expands, and then as it gets into the heart, it becomes smooth walled, but then it grows as well. And this one, you weren't involved with at all, RJ, but occasionally as echocardiographers here, we're asked to buy our um, hepatobiliary service to look at uh, hepatomas. And this is a patient who presented with a uh, right upper lobe liver hepatoma, and they just wondered uh, how much obstruction there was and how close it was to, um, to the right heart uh, in terms of being able to resect it. And they were successful in uh, uh, able uh, being able to resect it. And you can see that some of these tumors all look the same, whether they're benign, malignant, and uh, leomyomatosis, renal cell carcinoma, sarcoma, it's all the same. The imaging does not tell you the pathology. So in summary, cardiac tumors are very uncommon. You need multimodality imaging to help define the lesion. What you're looking really for is behavior. And the surgeon decides, it's me, <laughs> the <laughs> But the echocardiographer, you wrote this maybe. <laughs> the echocardiography is extremely important. Every time I give a lecture, I always talk about the importance of echo. It's extremely, extremely important, especially to the fine movement, the, the movement. And then you can see by that TE echo how it showed regression or transgression of the intraatrial septum. So it's very, very important. And that's it. Yep. And that's it. So thanks, everybody, for your attention. Enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vegas, Dr. Cosmano. That was uh, really interesting, and we'll bring some questions in at the end. We've got a couple from the audience and a couple from me, I think.